Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with the mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Randy Heron, the Senior Vice President of Construction Technologies and Manufacturing at TD Industries. She has had an impressive 20 plus year career as a leader in construction by leveraging innovation and utilizing technology to drive value creation through big picture and futuristic thinking. Recently, she has worked as part of the team that has launched a modular division within TD Industries that serves the owner direct market. Welcome to the show, Randy. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, how'd you get into the construction industry? Oh, my goodness. So the construction industry is kind of a family business for me. My father's a general contractor. And so like a lot of kids when they go off to school, you know, I was at Texas A&M University and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I kind of looked around and, you know, back then uh, catalogs were like paper books, right? They weren't, everything wasn't online yet. And so <laughs> I found uh, the Department of Construction Science at A&M and I thought, hey, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm interested in it. And I kind of grew up around it. So that's really, I didn't, I didn't go with the intention of being in the construction industry, but I guess I kind of stumbled upon, upon it and um, it was a very welcome in, welcoming industry. So I've been happy in it ever since. That's awesome. Anything surprise you as you start to get into it yourself that was a, a different perception seeing it as a kid through your, your father's lens? Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't see all the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> There's no conflict in construction. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see that when he comes home <laughs> at night, but, you know, just... Because it is, it's a very conflict, you know, riddled business because there's just so much uncertainty and, and gaps in, in our documents and whatnot. It's gotten better over time, but I think that was eye-opening. Um, I think it was also eye-opening, you know, 25 years ago to go into the construction industry and just kind of be in one of the only women around. Mm -hmm. It's a lot better now, but back then it was, I was very rare. And so just kind of getting my feet under me, starting um, from a of being the only one that looked different in the room took a little bit of getting used to, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's been a very, it's been a great experience. Um, it's, it's been great for my, you know, family. And I just really have always enjoyed being a part of it and look forward to being a part of it for the rest of my career. That's awesome. Uh, the trend lines of, of bringing more diversity in and bringing women more into the industry. Well, what have you seen there and, and how has, How's that kind of changed in over the, the years? Oh, you know, it's changed so much. There's so many options now that didn't used to exist. Yeah, you know, I don't think I don't think young women as are as limited as um, we used to be. Um, I think they see all opportunities and nothing stops them from going after something they're interested in. And so I'm seeing more and more female engineers, more and more women uh, project managers, women designers. I mean, it's just everybody's starting to move into a great industry uh, for great careers. So it's definitely been a change over time. I also see where um, companies, uh, our company and others are really leaning into the value of diversity within their team, not just gender diversity, but all diversity to make better decisions, to be able to see bigger pictures. Um, so it's an entire, it's really an exciting time to be in the construction industry. There's so much change coming and just really the diverse groups that are going to help us digest that change faster than we ever have. Uh, it's something to really look forward to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the awareness plays uh, have been really cool to see that kind of grow more prevalent in the industry. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is, is getting out to people outside of the industry as well, too, that construction is is open for business for all kinds of people? You know, I, th I think it's starting to. You know, it's the construction industry isn't always front and center. You know, it's not mm -hmm. something that's on TV, right? Or television or they're making movies about, right? And so, you know, a lot of kids are, you know, seeing marketing opportunities or, you know, healthcare opportunities because that's what they see. But especially as we're getting more and more into the engineering um the schools and whatnot, and the engineering schools are offering opportunities for not just straight engineering, but also, hey, here's some other product development or, you know, construction type opportunities. So I think there's a lot more to choose from uh, than there used to be for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm a, it's a little passion project of mine to kind of be on a, a mission to get that word out that construction is cool. This is a, is. a great place and to change those mis 
conceptions I think that people have outside of the industry, maybe some inside the industry too, but outside the industry of what this construction industry is really about and the technology and the innovation and the, the creativity that's here. Yeah, we're at an amazing time in construction. There's so much change happening and to be able to come into an industry right in the middle of kind of like this renaissance of what we're going through, mm -hmm. I think is exciting for kids as they graduate out of school. Um, it's the sky's the limit on how we can rethink uh, a pretty old industry and how we can drive data and just, you know, really lean into what the future has to offer and how do we change our processes and our systems to get there faster. So, you know, I do think that it is a whole lot more exciting um, than it used to be for sure. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, let's lean into that future mm -hmm. thinking for a, a okay. little bit. Where do you think the future of construction is, is going to go and what's going to look like in the next few yeah. years? I think the future of construction is about big data. You know, it's about robot robotics and automation, design for for automation, design for manufacturing and assembly. Um, you know, historically that wasn't what we were doing. Now we're like, how are we, how are we going to change to meet the to meet what the owners want? How are we going to help de-risk our business? You know, kind of as you look to the future and some of those changes I just talked about, what are the jobs of the future, right? What kind of skill sets are going to be needed? You know, lean manufacturing and agile, right? And digital transformation, change management, data analytics, right? Those are a whole set of skill sets that we weren't hiring for 10 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, right? And so, you know, to keep up with what that future is, you know, is really a new set of skills that we need to come into the industry. And the, the, the really tough part about the construction business is that it's a really complicated business and the margins that we make are really low. And so when I just talked about all those new jobs that we're gonna need, data analytics, right? Change management roles, we're all adding to our overhead, but our margins are still staying small. So the, how are we going to, you know, bridge that gap, right? And it's through increasing your productivity, really leveraging offsite fabrication, right? Getting pro more productivity out of the field, you know, getting, getting better um, through better data, understanding how you purchase and what you purchase so you can purchase even better. So, you know, our, our cost is shifting a bit with some expertise that we didn't used to have, but we're also hopefully able through all of our technology and changes that are coming on that front, being able to reduce our uh, cost by increasing our productivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of those big trend lines, there's, that's a big kind of mental shift for the historical construction industry to make that leap towards, which mm -hmm. again, requires that, that change management that, that you had talked about to really bring that about and make it happen going yeah. in the future. Maybe let's start, I'm a big believer in defining terms. Uh, how do, do you define and then kind of think about what change management really is as a concept? Well, I think of change management in three different parts. You know, first thing is kind of on the, from the leadership, from your executive mm -hmm. leadership team, from your CEO, you know, how are you, how are you aligning? You know, are you, do you own the same problems, Right. You know, what's the degree to which a person or a team feels that the problem you're trying to solve is theirs? You know, am I trying to solve a problem and I'm all in and I think modular is the way to go, but the rest of the leadership team thinks they're like 5% in, 10% in, you know, mm -hmm. are you owning the same problems that you're trying to solve? And then also just the alignment of those leadership teams, you know, like, you know, are we the path that we're going down to solve this problem, is it the path that I want to be on? Am I aligned on the path forward, right? And so I think it's really, really important that the executive leadership team provides that vision in that way. Because a lot of these, a lot of the construction companies, ours included, you know, we have different ge geographies, different um, leadership spread throughout different areas. And really for the change that's necessary for the future, we have to be very aligned ge geographically in the way that we initiate change and the way that we spread change through the organization. So to me, I can't even start talking about a formal change management program until I'm aligned from an executive point of view, right? Mm -hmm. 
And sure. if you have that and you're all going down the same path, you're aligned, you all own the same decisions, then you start thinking about, well, what is the change that needs to happen? Is it ready to go? And I, there's five E's of change that, um, of like a formal change pro management program that I use. And, you know, when you, there's a, a U-shaped curve for change that starts with, <laughs> you know, when you roll out change, it's like denial and resistance, right? <laughs> and so, you know, you're going down that U-shaped curve and denial and resistance. How can you change, you know, it, into like explore and commitment, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's just um, the change parent management program that I follow is just like five E's in that. And the first one is engage. You know, before you roll out change, how are you engaging with, the, with I call our people partners because we're an employee owned company. So if I say partners, it means employees, but yeah. how are you engaging with your partners? How do they know about this upcoming change? What kind of formal, um, communication programs do you have just even talking about change you know and I have, a, I have a, a somebody who I respect a lot he was um, brought in high high up in an organization to lead the organization and about a year and a half in they asked him to leave and I was talking to him and I said well what do you think what was looking back on it what do you think the major issue was and he said I think I didn't feel I had to explain the change, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So he he doesn't work there anymore. He want he he owned a problem. He was aligned on a pro problem. He saw a path forward, but those that he led didn't, and he didn't explain, right? And so that engagement is really really key. How do you engage your teams? How do you engage your stakeholders? And just a formal communication program to let them know what the change is that's happening. And then, you know, from there, the second E is enable, right? How do you enable change? How do you document formal change, process change, anything you're asking them to change? How do you document that into a training program? You know, a lot of times we just throw change out there, but do we have a formal training program to educate people on what they need to do? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, right? Change management's hard, but if you're you know, thinking about how do I engage and talk to people, how do I enable them through training programs, you know, that those are all really important steps to make sure that it just doesn't get, you know, you know, stuck in that denial and resistance part of that you, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, just moving forward on that, you just execute next, right? And as you're executing, you know, are there people that are just really objecting to it and why and figure that out so that you can continue to refine your training programs and your talking points. And then you just kind of evaluate it. You know, how, how has this change been? Do we need to pivot? Do we need to do anything different? And once you get out of that denial and resistance curve and you're, you're trending towards commitment, you know, how do I need to embed this within my organization? You know, because you're not just training the people that are here now, you're going to be training all of the people that are going to be coming after them. And so what kind of processes and procedures do you document formal training programs that you create to keep the learning going? And so that's kind of how I think about it is, you know, the, the first two pieces of just alignment and leadership, formal change, change management program. And then the third thing is just understanding the psychology of people to me. You know, there's the, the law of diffusion of innovation curve that a lot of people have seen. If you haven't, you can look it up online. But out of a general population, about 16% are what we call early adopters and innovators. And those early adopters and innovators, all they need for change is scarcity. They want to be the first ones to do it. So those are the ones that bypass that U-shaped curve. They go straight to commitment. They're excited. They want to try the change. They, they're big picture thinkers. They see the future and they're engaged in it, right? right. So, so even when you're thinking about formal change management, you know, what are those 16% of your general population of your company? How do you need to get them engaged? Because those people will help the, 80, the rest of the 84% of your general population they will help tip the idea to them because your 84% um, need proof that that change works. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you can just kind of keep in mind the psychology of people, most people don't like change, right? 16% do. That's a very small, very <laughs> small amount, right? So how can you get them what they need so that they can expedite the change and help the others uh, become okay with it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, long, it. a long answer to, you know, what do I think about change? <laughs> How do uh, I think through it for the organization? But that's kind of what I stick to. Yeah, that was great stuff. No, thank you for unpacking that. I, I like taking the the sixteen percent, making them the the champions for the rest of the eighty four, and, and helping them to convince and and talk it up. Of right. this is good. This is you know you can you can do this. This is not super scary. It's not going to break everything. Mm. All will be well. Right. I think a, a big part of change management is being able to really successfully craft a compelling reason and then motivation for each stakeholder group that's impacted as well, too. I think a trap that people can fall into is you get the alignment at the top mm -hmm. and then you just keep on saying that exact same reason and motivation all the way down for every single stakeholder, mm -hmm. which obviously that's going to be the underlying current that goes, but there's going to be different offshoots for different people for like the what's a driving motivational factor that keeps an executive up at night is probably not going to be right. what's keeping the person in the field up at night, which is not the person, not the same thing that's keeping the VDC person up at right. night as well. So you have to be able to take the, the, the main alignment and then adjust it and shift it to the audience that you're talking to of mm -hmm. what is keeping them up at night and how does it impact them right. or else that buy-in doesn't happen. Yeah, we're just um, rolling out um, what we're calling model-led workflows, you know, okay. model-first, model-driven business, right? Nice. And that's, you're talking about in constru a construction company where we're saying mo the model leads the way. That's yeah. a really big deal, right? Because uh, we have a lot of great men and women that are in the field and they've, you know, but who's come before them and them have built everything with their hands. This is very personal to them and to their families. And we're talking about leveraging the model for offsite manufacturing, but it really is going to be better for you. And this is why, and you're right. All of those different stakeholders along the way hear the same message, but crafted for them. The why might be a little bit different depending on where they are and who they are in the organization, but the message is similar, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've been on like a, a road show of the model led workflow rollout, right? And we've talked to so many different groups uh, within our organization, and we're going to continue to do that because then they hear it in a different way. So, you know, how do you need to follow up once you've rolled it out, right? And it changes so hard. And like I said, we're at such a time of great change um, that it's a lot of focus needs to, to be on it. And that's why we need those extra resources in our groups, those extra change management resources that we didn't have 20 years ago. We weren't thinking about that. You know, now we have an office of the PMO with project managers that work only on change management, right? And managing analysts, right? That didn't used to exist before, but that just speaks to the urgency and the need for it to manage all the change we're going through. Yeah, absolutely. I, I loved in that answer, you said the, the need to follow up as well too. I, I think mm -hmm. that's probably another trap that people fall in. They, they roll it out once and they're like, all right, done. You know, yeah. I, I gave my message. Everybody's bought in now and it's a continual it is. follow up and communicate with people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, let's shift a little bit and, and dive into data some. So how do you add so much value in data to groups that they just, they can't live without it and they become your champions, even if they were kind of skeptics on the front side? Yeah, you know, it's kind of like um, I bring design thinking into um, my strategy. And uh -huh. I think about design thinking is how do I understand, understand enough about who I'm building something for, you know, how do I have that deep empathy to create a tool that they can't live without, right? Like, like, like maybe an app that you use every day in your life that you can't live without, you know, how do you create that within your own business so that they're asking for change, you know, because that change is producing data that they, that they never had before, which you know, it's in the construction industry, I've been very data poor for a long time. So, 
you know, through technology and through, you know, plans that have, you know, been implemented over the past five or six years, you know, when we started on our journey uh, for a more model driven technology driven business, we had to say we want to first start by building our database, right? Mm -hmm. Our database of all of our parts and pieces. And so with the completion of that database and utilizing it in our model, it's our single source of truth that goes from the estimating model to the um, BIM model to manufacturing. So now that we have that, you know, that basis of data, that's what we're pulling out to run different Power BI reports on and different things. So that it's actually bringing some clarity, you know, and sometimes in the past in construction, we had to get to the end and just hope that we made budget. Now we can see along the way, you know, what particular part of this, um, of this drawing or this sheet in this area, what was our estimate for this area? Now that we've designed it, what's our estimate, you know, what's our final cost gonna be? And then what was that cost when it came out of manufacturing? And you actually have just checks along the way where you're getting data, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I was a little bit nervous about uh, in the last month is we've been rolling out model-led workflow. We're not, we've been talking about that change but now we're starting to have some of those data reports where people are going, oh, I love this. You know, at first, oh, I'm a little still a little nervous and scared about model led workflows. But now you're showing me the data from that. And this is amazing. And I'm all in. Right. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned it just then a little bit of there's, there's so many different sources of data coming into the construction industry right now. And it's it can be very easy to be overwhelmed by data everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you kind of think about the data strategy? And what should that really look like moving forward in collecting these different pieces of data and then having them talk to each other and not be just inundated with data yeah. for the sake of it? Yeah. Well, and this has been a really interesting year for us. In April, we launched a new ERP. Right. And so you've got a lot of big project, <laughs> huge project, overwhelmingly huge project, you know, and at the same time, uh, all of the different um, technology that rolls into that ERP that our different project teams are having to learn at the same time we're rolling out, you know, model led workflows and the software between model and manufacturer. And that is a lot, that is a lot of change for um, an, or any organization, anytime. I mean, every time you say new ERP to anybody that's been through it, they just have that, oh, that, knowing, <laughs> that knowing smile about how hard it really is to go through with all of that. But, um, but really that, that, I think you need that friction and ch of change if it was that easy, we would have done it a long time ago. It's really hard. It takes a lot of, a lot of really smart people working really hard in the same direction and making really good choices to be able to set you up for the future. I, I think that nothing really comes easy. And mm -hmm. I think just an ERP implementation kind of proves that, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And it's worth having access to all of that information. And, you know, something that came along that way was just all of the IT infrastructure that goes with that. And then the construction technology uh, people that we've added over the last few years to just get that excellence within your organization to be able to oversee those technology choices um, to make sure that we're providing the best resources to our partners. Mm. Nice. You guys are ambitious. You're, you're not afraid to tackle it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's the thing. It's really interesting. The construction industry has mega companies in it and some really small companies. So where are you on that continuum to where you can really afford to invest in technology to get you to the next level, right? And so right. It, it is a huge investment and it's really hard for construction companies because like I said earlier, our margins aren't that high, mm -hmm. you know? And so... At, at what scale um, do you have the resources to be able to really invest in the technology uh, people and um, tools to be able to scale something like this? Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of shifting a, a bit into the, the scaling side of things, how do you really leverage the, the manufacturing principles as DFMA is coming into construction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another, everything's difficult. That's another, <laughs> right? DFMA, no easy answers here. <laughs> yeah. 
design for manufacturing and assembly. Um, you know, we have a fairly large uh, BIM design group and that serves a large construction, large construction teams throughout the state of Texas and Arizona. And, you know, we are educating within VDC and our BIM groups, we're educating on designing for manufacturing and assembly. How do we, how do we go above and beyond? How do we really think through not just how we're going to fabricate the air handling unit connections or this corridor section or the risers, but how are we going to also deliver it? And what kind of information can you embed into the model, right? How are you thinking through the entire process? So we can educate and train on that within our, our VDC, our BIM designers, but then you also have to have the right culture from the project teams, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they're deciding what fabs on their job, even though you've invested in a model and the entire model is there for you, there's still project level decisions on which parts and pieces are gonna be fabricated. And so what kind of culture are you growing within your organization that doesn't just span within your VDC teams, but also spans within your project teams. And even if you think up, up, upstream of your project teams is your estimating. If you can get with the estimating groups and have the additional cost associated with corridor rack systems for the steel or pump skids or any other material that you need outside of your model pipe valve fitting duct work, you know, and put that in your estimate, then project teams are more likely to go with those solutions and not think, oh, I can do it more effectively and efficiently if I just build it myself in the field, you know? So I think, you know, I think that the companies that are really on top of DFMA and leading the way have driven the culture for offsite manufacturing solidly through their organization, right? And again, that, that the construction business is an old line business with men and women building things with their hands and how do you transition that you know, into model-led, model-driven, straight into manufacturing. And a lot of it has to do with making the right decisions in the way you estimate as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, Randy, have, what have you seen as kind of the, if there's a, a trend on the light bulb moment where the, the aha light bulb goes off and people go, oh, I, I get why DFMA is important and why this, um, why this is happening. And, and people really latch in and buy into it? You know, this is, there's probably a couple different answers. I see the people who really buy into it early are from owners that are mandating that on their jobs. Yeah. I, I mean, I hate to say it's it a that big way. Incentive. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but a lot of it is coming from being challenged in new ways from our owners, which I absolutely love. I love working with the repeat owners uh, that build over and over and over again that are saying, I want you to build a different way. Because when you when you build that different way with those owners, you have that proof, right? You're convincing the other 84% of your general population that it works, right? And so, you know, to have that, to have that as a driver is really important. But at the same time, having to have the infrastructure there from from thinking about it, from estimating all the way down to install is really a heavy lift for us. But um, there's definitely champions within the organization and I'm just looking forward to as we scale more and more and more. Yeah, awesome. If, if you could innovate one thing in the industry, what would you tackle? Oh my gosh, that's such a big question. <laughs> um, you know, there's so many great people working on such great innovations. They're there. You know, um, I think I think what I would love to see is how do we innovate something that helps a culture shift across the industry faster? How do we change our culture? The tools are there. How do we change our culture to use the tools? Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, but there is there is so much brilliance in technology and products that are coming on. Um, there's so much, you know, reason behind the why for offsite manufacturing. It's just the execution. We just need to execute on it. You know, we're so much infrastructure is going in to support it um, from the design point of view, from engineering and designing. It's just, we've got all the pieces there, you know, let's just yeah. execute. 
Uh, how do you, have you seen the last two years impact the the culture aspect and the, the execution and adoption of technology? The last two years, just because the conversations have been changing and the owners are shifting. Is that yeah, it? and and about? COVID thrown in there too of having to adopt yeah. technology in a way that you you didn't have to. And obviously, construction you have to be on site as well too. Yeah, you can't get around that. But there's, yeah, but I'm just curious. You know, I do think it. I think it's good. I think the last two years has helped us move faster. Mm -hmm. You know, it's we have. It is. It has created us to process things at such a speed, um, like when when everybody moved home because of COVID, right? You had to, to work from your house. You know, within a week's time, we were in the cloud. You know, with all of our designers, right? Mm -hmm. Like 70, 75 designers in the cloud and functioning and working. You know, we could do that. We could do that really fast. It's helped us see that you can change faster, right? Mm -hmm. I think the speed of change has increased for sure. Yeah. One of the things that I'm really fascinated by, and I think that the, the last couple of years has kind of proved it out is there are so many just brilliant creative problem solvers in construction mm -hmm. that I just don't think a lot of them have necessarily maybe taken the time to think about the technology lens. Yeah. And so it was kind of the accelerator that they had to put their creative problem solving hat on with the technology over the last yeah. two years. And so it, you saw that clip of like, oh yeah, we can do this. This we got this, right? And they use that creative problem solving that they have on the job site. You're always fixing problems on the job site and figuring out a way to to make yeah. it happen. Yeah, well, and even you know before I started um, in the role that I'm in at TD, at TD Industries right now, I was the I ran our new construction business in Houston for a while. Okay. You know, and so to have that deep in, empathy with the construction business and, and, you know, what our struggles are. And I loved the construction side of our business, but I knew that the future of our business was in the model and manufacturing, you know? So that's where my heart was telling me to go. And I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to work with a company like TD Industries that let me make that shift. But that that's the same thing is we've got a lot of great creative people and creative problem solvers that can see a different future yeah. you know and how do you use them in different ways within an organization to help you get there faster right yeah yeah I love it, it you got to empower those creative people to mm -hmm. figure it out and, and let them kind of run give them yeah. some test environments to make it happen yeah well how do people find out more information and connect with you Oh, well, I'm, you know, I have a LinkedIn page um, and, you know, I, and you can find me at TD Industries. TD Industries is out there. We have a web, uh, you know, a great web website, you know, we're, like I said, we're in Texas and Arizona, but we're not just builders. We're also facility maintenance and we're also service technicians. So we have a, a wide offering throughout Air Texas and Arizona. Awesome. Well, final question for you. What mm -hmm. does innovation mean to you? That's a good question. Um, innovation means to me finding new answers to old problems. And I don't know if that's technically a, a, a real definition for innovation, but it's it's the ability to see a different future, right? And the steps that you need to take to get there. Because not, every, not everybody sees in the future. A lot of people see in the past and they see the present, but what future thinkers are out there to really look and see a different way and bring that way or that different way back into the organization and frame it to which you can get ownership and alignment around it. You know, can you get the leadership to align on, you know, the, the way that you see the future? The pro how are you going to solve the problems of the future? Um, so that's kind of what I think about when I think about innovation, you know, not everybody sees the future and, and, you know, who in your organization does and how can you start incorporating them, you know, into your leadership groups so that you can start working towards that future. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, so that's always my final wrap up question. And um, People surprise me every single time I ask that question because you think it's such a straightforward 
yeah. uh, answer. And it's not, there's so many different lenses and vantage point. Uh, I love the, the future thinking you know, tie into it. You could take all of those answers and compile them in a book and it would be fascinating. <laughs> we, and, we just have. <laughs> a bridging gap book. That's, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it is. It's really fascinating the, the um, different takes on it. Yeah, the definition of innovation from a hundred different people, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Randy, thank you so much for taking the time and, and chatting today. I have a, a whole page of notes. I'm excited to, to re listen to this episode to get even more. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. You know, when you called, I'm like, are you sure you want to talk to me? There's some really smart people that work for me. Don't you want them? I'm just kind of a big vision person. And so I appreciate the um, the time that you've given me to talk about vision. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, this was great.